So, um, the title of my talk today is Trouble, Shaking and Hope. And right at the beginning of January, one of the verses that God gave me for this year was that the Valley of Acor will become the doorway of hope, which fits right into the, uh, into the series that Mark is bringing on hope. And I know he said, uh, it felt a bit blunt, didn't it, the way that I kind of <laughs> came back at him, nope, I don't want to do that. But it, I just felt that this, was, this is a word in season for the church. So, the Valley of Acor will become the doorway of hope. That's Hosea 2.15. And I've been in this verse for some weeks. I've been sucking the marrow out of it. Well, I'm going to give you some context to start off with. So this verse is referencing the story of the Israelites in the book of Joshua. The valley of Achor was the way into Canaan. And the city of Jericho was right on the boundary between the valley of Achor and Canaan, which is the promised land. And Jericho, which most of you know, was where Joshua led the Israelites around the walls seven times, and the walls fell down, and the city was conquered. And after this glorious victory, the Israelites were poised to go into the promised land to take the rest of the territory, but something went wrong. The Lord had given Joshua an instruction not to take anything from Jericho as spoil. It was all to be dedicated to God. But there was one man Achan, there's always one, isn't there? There was one man who disobeyed and he took for himself a beautiful Babylonian robe and some gold and silver and he hid them. No one knew, but God knew. And the upshot was that instead of experiencing a victory at their next battle, they experienced a crushing defeat, which long story short, ultimately led to Achan being taken outside the camp, his sin was exposed, and he was taken outside the camp, his entire family, and they were stoned to death. Seems a bit harsh, doesn't it? <laughs> but God takes sin very, very seriously. So the name of the valley and the name of the man are meaningful. Achor means trouble, and Achan means troubler. So we have the troubler in the valley of trouble. And it's easy for us to judge Achan for his dishonesty and his sneakiness, like we judge the Israelites sometimes, wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. I wouldn't have done that. It's very easy for us to do that. But actually, Achan is a type of man, a type of sinful man. Job said, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Who of us has not sinned and tried to hide it? This is the state of the whole human race. And I'm not just talking about, you know, the obvious sins or even the secret sins. We're not just sinners because we do sin. We're sinners because without Christ, sin is our human condition. And, you know, we develop all sorts of addictive habits to cover our sin condition. We, we disconnect. We speak lies over ourselves, you know, we, we self-limiting, destructive lies, and we believe things about ourselves that are not true. We limit where we're going in life because of our sin condition, and ultimately we die because of our sin condition. Man that is born of woman is full of trouble. You're probably thinking at this point, I'm so pleased I'm here to listen to the encouraging talk on hope. <laughs> it gets better. So, 700 years fast forward from this tragic incident at Achor, the prophet Hosea redeems it when he prophesies that the valley of Achor will become the doorway of hope. What is this doorway of hope? Mark began to unpack this in the very first session. It's not wishful thinking. That's the way the world frames hope. Biblical hope is none other than Jesus Christ himself because he is the doorway for the sheep and he is our living hope. That's 1 Timothy 1. And Jesus, like Achan, was taken outside of the camp and killed. Achan became a curse to the Israelite people and Jesus became a curse for us so that we could enter in through him. 
For surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Surely he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement for our peace is upon him. So I have a question for you. What trouble are you facing right now? And really this fits in really well with the word that you brought, Steph. What trouble are you facing right now? Ask yourself. Get real with yourself right now. What is it that is in you that is troubling you? What is it that is in you that is preventing you from entering in? Because it's right there in that place where you just can't seem to get a handle on your habitual sin. It's in that place where you feel like you've been going round and round in cycles of despair. In that place, it feels to you like the lowest place in your life. It's right there, right there that Jesus steps in. And he says, I will make that place a doorway of hope. Church, don't believe the lie that you've got to get yourself better before Jesus will love you. That is religion. That is not the gospel. Jesus climbs into trouble with us and he shows us the way out. So we've just said that Achor is the way into Canaan. Canaan represents the promised land. Canaan symbolizes the spirit-filled life here in this lifetime. This is not a metaphor for heaven per se because there are giants there that have to be overcome. Canaan is a spirit-filled life in this life, and it is blessing and abundance and rest. It's kingdom living. It's the land of destiny for every believer in Jesus, because each one of us here has got a destiny in Christ, and it's highly bespoke. I can't do your destiny, and you can't do mine. We've all got one. But Canaan is not where the church has been at for a long time. And this is not doctrine. This is my observation. You can disagree. It seems to me that the church, the global church, I'm not talking about this church, I'm talking about the global church, has been on a meandering journey through the wilderness, through cessationism, through heavy shepherding and control, through the word of faith, the prosperity gospel, through hyper-grace, through the seeker-sensitive movement, and through alliances with culture and politics and Marxism. I mean, and that is just in, you know, as long as I've been walking with Christ in the last 30 or so years. I mean, I think, you know, the church has been meandering around for about 2,000 years. And here we find ourselves in the Valley of Trouble. We've edged ever closer to Canaan and we find ourselves in the valley of trouble. Truly, judgment begins with the house of God, and it seems like barely a week goes by without another mega church leader being exposed for secret sin. But you know, before we point fingers at them, God is doing the same in us. Because our Achan-like tendencies prevent us from entering into Canaan. Our sin nature that seeks to trust in gold and silver from the temporal realm. Not the treasure that God wants to bring us, but the temporal realm's treasure. And our sin nature that seeks to clothe itself in garments from Babylon. I don't know about you, there's a part of my flesh nature that just yearns to be clothed with the comforts and the provisions and the sparkly things of the world. But the thing is, Canaan represents the spirit-filled life. And we must know that we cannot take our flesh in there. We can't take our sin into Canaan. It has to be nailed to the cross of Christ so that we can enter in. Jesus is coming back for an overcoming bride. He's coming back for a glorious bride without spot or wrinkle or blemish, not one loitering in the valley of trouble. I'm going to segue here. First, I'm going to have a sip of water. I'm going to segue here and tell you about an encounter I had a couple of months ago. So I I was lying in bed one evening in that kind of liminal space between being awake and asleep. And I heard something in my spirit. I heard it on three or four separate occasions. 
that night. It was a really distinctive sound, but I didn't have a clue what it was. The only word really I could use to describe it was shuttering. It was like a rapid opening and closing of doors, a shuttering sound. I didn't know what it was, so I kind of parked it and waited for further revelation. And then about a week later, I've written the date, Tuesday the 23rd of November, a friend sent me a clip of seismic activity recorded in Grindavik, Iceland. You probably remember all of the stuff, the you know, volcanoes and things that were going on there. So it's a clip of seismic activity that had been turned into sound waves with the title, If the Human Ear Could Hear Impending Seismic Activity. And that sound of seismic activity was exactly the shuttering sound that I had heard in my half-dream state. And then the next night, drifting off to sleep, I heard it again. And I knew that the Lord was speaking. So as I sat with this subsequently, I felt to, first of all, to look up the, the root meaning of seismic. For anybody that knows me, it's always my go-to. I'm always rummaging around in words and Greek and Hebrew. Is that I find it so illuminating. So the root meaning of seismic, it's from the Greek seizo, which means to shake. Now, I don't know about you, but I get the sense since COVID, it kind of feels like we've almost gone back to normal. I know things are more expensive, but other than that, it's kind of, you know, COVID felt like a shaking, didn't it? But we're kind of almost gone back to normal. But I'm here to say the shaking is not over. The shaking has barely begun. Hebrews 12, 25 to 29 says this, See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake, Sizo, and not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing and transformation of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 25 to 29. So God is shaking and he will shake everything that can be shaken. What is the purpose of this shaking? It's to bring forth the kingdom. Shaking will remove and transform everything that can be shaken. And we've just read that that's created things. And created things in the Greek is to make and to do. So this is everything that man does and makes in the natural realm in the earth and the heavens and the earth. So only that which cannot be shaken remains and what cannot be shaken is the kingdom of God. And do you not know that the kingdom of God is within you? So the degree to which you belong to the kingdom and to which you have submitted your mind and your soul to the kingdom and to kingdom truths and to kingdom ways and to kingdom purposes, this is the degree to which you will not be shaken when the shaking comes. Why am I talking about shaking? I seem to have gone from trouble to shaking. I'm talking about shaking because we can think that shaking is trouble, but there's a difference. Trouble is what resides in our flesh. Shaking comes from God. Why? To remove everything within us that keeps us tethered to trouble. Achan sinned and then he hid his sin and we have done the same. Shaking will expose us. As I've journeyed through life, I've bumped into pockets and seasons of shaking that have exposed sin lurking in the depths of my heart that I didn't even know was there. It was hidden, but the shaking exposed it. Shaking will expose our idols. It, it will expose every place that we have put our faith that is not Jesus. It will expose every place of unbelief, every place of doubt and fear. 
In order to understand this a bit further, I find that it's, it's helpful to, to go back to the Greek for shaking, the word seismo. As I said, I do love words. <laughs> so what is so seismo, seismology, what is seismology? Seismology is a study of earthquakes. And earthquakes happen very simply. This is earthquakes for Egypt. Earthquakes happen very simply where there is friction between two tectonic plates along a fault line, which causes a sudden breaking apart, a splitting of the ground along that fault line. And the etymology of tectonic is from the Greek to build. I'm married to an architect. That means master builder. So I have another question for you. How are you building? Because how we have been building is being exposed in the earth right now. Matthew 7, 24 to 27 speaks of the wise and foolish builders. We know that story. We know that parable. One built his house on the rock and the other on the sand. And when adverse conditions came, when the storms and the shaking came, only the house built on the rock survived. The house built on sand fell with a great crash. Building on the sand is building on what is temporal. It might look solid and wise from a human perspective, but when the rains and the shaking comes, that building will be revealed as unfit. But you know, there is a way to build that withstands storms and shaking, and it's this. It's to be faithful to the blueprint that the divine architect has drawn and set out for your life. It's to walk in the fullness of your destiny, to occupy your portion of the promised land. We've all got a portion. It's to build on the rock of the revelation of Jesus Christ. What's he revealing to you? What's he saying to you? What are the words he's speaking over you as an individual? It's when we hear those words and put them into practice, when we heed God's words spoken over us, and we move in that direction, that's when we become kingdom builders. And actually, this is restoration. When we do that, we're being restored. We're being restored back to original design, to who we were intended to be in the first place. Before we did all the messy stuff in the world, God redeems us back to who he says we are. He renames us. And when we walk in original design, we are kingdom builders. But here's the thing, it's not easy to be a kingdom builder because it requires faith. You can't build the kingdom using systems and means of the flesh. You can't build it using formulas. You can't build the kingdom using sense and reason and logic because they belong to the temporal realm and they're gonna go. We have to build out of faith. And the thing is, faith often doesn't make sense to our carnal mind and to our natural mind. But nevertheless, it's the currency of the kingdom. It will take great faith to build on the rock, but that is the only way to do it. Unbelief will be shaken, pride will be shaken, doubt will be shaken, and fear will be shaken. And our faith is tested every time there is a shaking so that our faith comes forth as gold. I need to tell you, church, that the middle ground is disappearing in the church right now. As the shaking intensifies, fault lines are revealed in all of our building and the tectonic plates are forced apart. The true church, the remnant church, is being separated unto holiness to become a bride who will marry Jesus. The false church is being separated unto religion and works of the flesh to become a harlot bride who will marry the world. Lord, have mercy. We are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And as the things which can be shaken fall away, the kingdom is revealed within us. Haggai 2, 6 to 9 says this. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come. That's Jesus. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. 
the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. This blows my mind. As God shakes the heavens, the sea and the land, as he shakes the nations, he gives us promises, certainties that are attached to this shaking. When God shakes us, it's not just so that we feel a bit shaky. He's bringing forth his kingdom and there is great hope for us. But as we get shaken, we get shaken out of trouble and into destiny, into kingdom purposes. I will shake all nations and what is desired by all nations will come and I will fill this house with glory. This house. God's going to fill this house with glory. And that's not just, you know, it's not going to be over there in the corner. We are the house. We are the church. God's going to fill us with his glory. How we long for the glory. (laughs) We pray for the glory. We beseech God to send the glory. We prophesy about it. And God says, I'm waiting for you to deal with your trouble. We're not ready for the glory of God. If the glory of God were to descend right now, half of us would be struck dead. There are some other scriptures that speak of shaking. The 12, when they were in the upper room, there was a shaking then, and what happened? They all got filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke with great boldness. And what happened when Paul and Silas were in prison? They were rejoicing and the foundation shook and the prison doors were opened and their chains fell off and they walked out free. I'm taking these stories as blueprints of what to expect and hope for in seasons of shaking. So this year is the year 2024, I'm sure you all know that. And it's the the Hebrew year 5784. And in the Hebrew alphabet, the number four is the Dalet. Delta in Greek, it's the fourth letter. And it's literally a pictogram of a door. And we can think that numbers of years are a bit meaningless. But Hebrew scholars always believed and taught that there is prophetic revelatory significance to each year. So this year has been called the year of the door or the year of the open door. And that door, as we have said and we've unpacked, is hope in Christ. It's also a doorway out of trouble. And it's also a doorway into destiny, into Canaan, into kingdom living. Now, this is obviously not only available to us this year. This has been available to us for 2,000 years. But because of the urgency of the times, the urgency of the hour, and what is coming on the earth, there is a strong exhortation this year for us to leave our sin behind and to enter in. I'm going to give you some keys to walk, for you to walk out of the valley of trouble and through the doorway of living hope into your promise. So the first key is repentance. I think we've got the wrong concept of repentance. I think we're a bit frightened of it. I think our heads sometimes go to Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. But... There's joy in repentance. There's freedom in repentance. There's healing in repentance. James 5.16 says, confess your sins, yes, to God, but also to one another that that you may be healed. It's a posture of transparency, of bringing hidden things into the light so that the powers of darkness no longer have a hold over you. A while ago, I was reading a commentary on... um, Key of David in Isaiah 22, 22. I don't think anyone has actually settled on what the key of David is. I've read so many different commentaries on it. But one interpretation rang so true in my spirit, and it's this, that the key of David is that David was a man after God's heart. Psalm 139, 23 to 24, David says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And if you want a revival prayer to pray, start with that one. It always starts with us. Key two is humility. The root 
of the Dalet, pictogram of the door, is Dalal. It means poor. And this is so instructive. Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And remember, the kingdom of heaven is the only thing which cannot be shaken. It's that Canaan symbol of kingdom living. So this word poor, in the Strong's it says this. It, it's, the word is patoxus, and it means to crouch or cower like a beggar, to be bent over, deeply destitute, completely lacking resources. And it, relate, it relates to the pauper rather than the mere peasant. The pauper rather than the mere peasant. And I thought it meant shopping at Lidl as opposed to Waitrose. <laughs> so this, this is a posture of deep humility and paucity of spirit that is required in order for us to enter through the doorway of living hope. But the thing is, when we position our hearts in humility, King Jesus moves all of heaven towards us. Humility is the heart posture necessary for promotion and breakthrough in the kingdom. In fact, did you know that the actual meaning of the word Canaan is to be humbled, to be subdued, to be brought low? The way into Canaan, the way out of trouble and into Canaan is the way of the kingdom and it's the way of the cross. We can't access or occupy Canaan in the pride of our flesh. When we operate in pride, we can't open those doors. And what is pride? It's every place we are not in agreement and alignment with God's words. Every place we think we know better. And pride is a shapeshifter. Because we think, you know, it's thinking that we're, we're, a, bit, we're a bit puffed up and we, um, we think we're better than others or, you know, we're too good or we, we get judgy. But pride can also look like false humility. God had to teach me that when I say to him, God, I can't do that. I can't do it. Please pick someone else. I can't do it. God had to tell me that actually that's pride. It might look like humility from a human point of view, but from God's point of view, it's pride. And really, it's unbelief. It's lack of trust. It's a reliance on sense and reason and circumstance. It's not a posture of faith. It takes a lot of humility to stand in faith. So key three, agreement. Speak in agreement with God. Hebrews 10.23 says, hold fast the confession of your hope. That word confession also means agreement. The doors are voice activated. The power of life and death is in the tongue, and we know this. When shaking comes and trouble is flying about everywhere, it's a very human tendency to want to complain. And, you know, we look at our circumstances and we want to complain, but we must choose to speak his words over ourselves, not our own, because his words are spirit and life. Ours, not so much. Agreement is powerful. It's not just about you agreeing with your prayer partner, although that's great and that is necessary there is also a level of agreement needed within us, between our soul and our spirit, between what God is saying and what you are saying in your head. Choose his words, agree with him, that's faith. Number four is courage, key four is courage, be courageous. So I've mentioned a few times the need to walk by faith in order to inherit and step into destiny, into your kingdom purposes. God told Joshua, Caleb and the Israelites, Many times as they were preparing to go in, have I not commanded you, be strong and very courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Be strong and very courageous. It takes courage to go where God says to go. It takes courage to inherit the kingdom because you know why? The minute that God gives you a vision of who you are in him and where he is taking you, a wall of fear will manifest in front of you and tell you all of the reasons why you can't go there, why it's not for you, how you're not equipped or ready or good enough or smart enough, etc. It takes courage to look that fear in the eye and keep going. My mentor taught me to say this, fear, intimidation, I see you and I will not partner with you. I have to do that every day. <laughs> if God says you can, you can. Whose report will you believe? That always reminds me of that Ron Canoli song. 
don't know if any, probably some old timers here that remember that. I'm not going to sing it. Key five, rejoicing. And this is where we started, our key verse for this series. Rejoice in hope, Romans 12, 12. Rejoice from your valley. Rejoice from your prison. The valley of trouble isn't avoidable. We all come this way. You are actually in the valley of trouble. You are being set up to enter in. Paul and Silas sang praises to God from their prison cell. Now, I don't know whether their praises caused the foundations to shake or whether the shaking came first, but they praised God anyway. But regardless of what came first, as their rejoicing combined with the shaking, what happened? Their chains fell off, the doors of the prison cells were opened, and they walked out into freedom. Psalm 30, I'm just finishing now. Psalm 34, 7, as the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him to deliver them. There are delivering angels assigned to each one of us. We can't deliver ourselves. We can't open our own prison doors. We can't propel ourselves out of the valley of trouble and in through the doorway of hope. But there is one who can. His name is Jesus. It's our job to posture ourselves in such a way that the Holy Spirit and the deliverance angels can do their job. And when we do that, when we use these keys, the might of God, Jehovah Sabaoth, God the man of war, is with us. And the shakings that are coming on the earth, and they will come, but for us who belong to Jesus, those shakings will shake us out of our trouble, out of every place we have been held captive, out of our personal pits and prisons, and that shaking will shake us out of fear, out of our self-limiting beliefs, out of our habitual sins, if we will posture ourselves. And as God shakes the earth, we are being shaken out of those prisons, out of the prison doors, and into doorways of destiny. And as we posture our hearts to build his house, not our house, his house, his equipping, silver and gold, his treasure, not Achan's sneaky treasure, his treasure is being shaken into our laps. That's what it says in Haggai. And the glory of the Lord is coming to fill us. And it says in Haggai, and it is promised, in this place I will grant peace. Amen. Just going to pray quickly as we finish. Oh, Lord, we know, Lord, that we will encounter trouble in this life. You never promised us an easy ride. You said in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. And Lord, I just pray for us as a church today, Lord God, that in our trouble we will look to you, the overcoming one. Lord God, I pray that you would come against shame, you would come against um, you would come against disappointment that people are feeling. You would come against any sense of, I can't do it. Jesus, would you presence yourself amongst your people today? Would you come to them in their valley of trouble and be the doorway of hope that leads us out into destiny? Jesus, we fix our eyes on you. We fix our eyes on you. bless you, Lord. We thank you that you are the overcoming one and you have not left us destitute. You've not left us in the valley of trouble, but you've made a way out. Forgive us, Lord, but we keep ourselves in that valley. This day, Lord, we choose to enter in through the doorway of hope, into Canaan, into rest, into abundance, into promise. 